Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Discord chat. I'm your host, Dan, and joining me today is Lorne Lanning, Chief Creative Officer and co-founder here at Oddworld Inhabitants. Welcome to the show. Lorne, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. And uh, thank you for having me on, Dan. And thank you, everyone, for showing up. Now, before we get started, uh, this has been a hot topic here on the Discord. Uh, The community want to know, Lorne, have you retired to the Yemen's? (laughs) <laughs> it's, I, I hope someday. <laughs> the uh, I, I've, uh, I, hope, I hope actually I hope I'm living in the place where we'll retire, which is uh, Sedona, Arizona. And um, I, at I the moment, you're you, you, you're still you're still at the head of the game. Yeah, yep. So I'm still 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 in the biz, and um, uh, but you know, retirement always seems like this fleeting dream. <laughs> kind of you wake up and it fades, you know. And, um, but, you know, Sedona is kind of interesting because so many times, uh, we looked at Sedona for reference in the games, you know, like going back to, um, Abe's, Ex- Abe's Odyssey with, uh, Paramonia, a lot of that reference was actually sort of Sedona and, um, other, other projects that I had done through the years. I had a lot of books on Sedona, but if you're, if you love the environments of Oddworld, you're not familiar with Sedona and you should just, um, you know, Google, Google image it. It's uh, a lot of people say, you know, amongst the top, most beautiful places in the world, but it's really remote. <laughs> so we have lots of big creatures crawling out of the woods, that's for sure. What's, what's the most craziest creature encounter that you've had well, we, so far? We were, uh, Sherry and I were standing in the dining room and um, during the day, and normally we have two little Chihuahua mutts that were rescues and they're adorable, but they're only like 11 pounds each. And as the as we were about talking about letting them outside in a patio, everything here has enclosed patios because of scorpions, rattlesnakes, tarantulas, you know, little things like that all over the place. And um, how do you just sleep? About the, <laughs> well, the, <laughs> the people learn how to live with these things. You know? <laughs> but uh, and the cockroaches come from the mountains, not from oh, the restaurants. God. So it's like a whole nother level of oh my god, right? Like don't go flipping rocks over. <laughs> you don't want to do that. But. Uh, so we're standing there in the kitchen about 10 feet from a um, stucco wall that encloses the back patio in the backyard. And uh, suddenly about a 40 pound bobcat just jumped up like like seven feet away from us. It must not have seen us behind the glass. And uh, if it, you know, bobcats are pretty mystical looking creatures, but he just then just walked along the wall like it was a tightrope looking to see if there was any chihuahuas to eat. And it was like oh, around uh-huh. lunchtime, so it made sense. But that's the type of thing, <laughs> that's the type uh-huh. of thing that can happen here. You just look outside. There's always uh, huge coyotes going through the yards, big packs of uh, javelinas, which are – they're not actually pigs, but you would think they were pigs. And they look a lot like pigs, but they're totally adorable. And they go in these huge packs. They're up to like 60 pounds. So you have like these herds of things, you know, moving about. There's also mountain lions and uh, – Bighorn sheep, I mean, like in the neighborhood, like literally, you know, sightings right on the, right on the street. So it's cr- kind of crazy, kind of great. Well, very, very, very interesting. Well, I appreciate that insight. Um, so folks, you know, Arizona is the place to go to, to, to see all those things. <laughs> it's remote. It's, it's very remote. And I'm kind of liking that. <laughs> Cool. Just one more question before we dive in, and this has been a hot topic on on the internet, and it'd be great to get your your take on this. So, are there more doors or wheels in the world? <laughs> so, you know, I wasn't even aware of this uh, until this morning that that this was you know trending, and so I thought about it. And my first thought was, okay, let's go with where the highest population of cars is per people. And let's just think about that sound. So to the best of my knowledge, that's Beverly Hills. And I think the population of cars was five to one, five cars for every one person. And I was like, okay, well, now how many doors is that? Right. And I was thinking, well, how many doors do they have in their homes? And then I was thinking, wait a minute, cars have doors too. And so an average four wheel car has two, two doors or four doors. And then an average motorcycle has none. So motorcycles, mopeds, and bicycles have no doors. But the average house has probably um, four to 15 to 20 doors, depending. And so I, ha- I have to just intuitively go doors. There's got to be more doors than cars because 
I think less than half the world actually owns a car. And I'm not exactly sure of the ratio, but, you know, so if you consider that, that's a lot less wheels. So that's that's my guess. My guess is doors. Okay. All right. Cool. <clears throat> How did I rank? I didn't Google. So I got to be completely off. From the, from the poll, the initial poll, uh, people were talking about wheels, but it's, I think it's, I think it was about 10% difference between wheels and doors. Okay. But, you know, folks, if you're, if you're listening, something that you want to discuss in chat, we'd be interested to hear your thoughts as well. Now, just bringing it back to uh, the podcast, the reason why we're doing this and uh, what's to come. Uh, so over the coming months, uh, approximately 10 months or so, uh, we're going to be doing these live chats with Lorne plus special guests and giving you, the community, the opportunity to put questions direct to Lorne and to our guests on our featured topics. Now, if you want to ask any questions, all you need to do is join the official uh, Oddworld discord server which is discord.gg forward slash oddworld i know a lot of people here are already here but for people living listening on the podcast this is the place to be and you can ask your questions in the discord chat slash questions we're going to do our best to answer as many as possible in the time that we have available but some of the questions aren't super relevant to our topic for today but we will come back to them uh over the coming months or so so uh, topic discussion. Uh, for our first episode, we're going to go back to where it all started. And uh, the question is, how did you create Oddworld? And what was the idea and what was the inspiration behind it all? So first, I want I, I, I consider myself first sort of a, a storyteller, really. And I came to the belief that if we had the power to tell stories, what kind of stories should we tell? And I, I was heavily inspired by... Um, when I saw the series Power Myth by Joseph Campbell, and it was in interviewed in George Lucas's uh, library at Lucas Ranch. And they were just talking about the power of myth through time and what that meant to society. And I also have a deep interest in indigenous cultures and shamanic cultures. And they also, uh, you know, we, we could say from from cave, cave times on up, from, you know, cave dwellings to the contemporary times, Stories have always served. You know, in the beginning, we had paintings of animals on the walls, you know, because we needed to hunt to survive. And so we kind of ritualized what we needed to do to survive and put forth that, that sort of energy of this is what we need to do. So let's kind of celebrate that before it happens and, and with the hopes that it happens sooner. <laughs> That's a, a little wild. Uh, sorry, but, but it is a context of how I see storytelling. And so I think in the process of sort of creating myths, so to speak, is what is what is our society or world going through? And how might you create content that uh, may not necessarily be popular, but might be something that people are feeling sort of a thirst for? And um, I know that I felt that way about certain films, certain stories, certain characters, certain songs, you know, different artists. Uh, and I felt, well, if we have the power to tell stories, then can we make stories sort of resonate deeper with the beings that we are in the times that we live in? And how do you talk about that in a way that doesn't polarize people? And what's a medium that would allow that creativity of freedom, even though, you know, it'd still be costing millions of dollars to make? And I would compare that to Hollywood in that um, film directors, for the most part, <clears throat> do not have what's called uh, final cut. And that really goes to the, the creative storytelling. And if the studio, with its huge financial investment, decides that the marketing department or the review committees have better ideas of how a film should be edited or, or uh, shaped to be more um, financially performant, then they, 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 they don't have a choice. And um, the, the director or the creator wouldn't necessarily have a choice. Only a few people have really had that choice in the history of Hollywood. And, um, the, and we call it uh, final cut. You get the final cut. Well, the game industry was still maturing, whereas the film industry was fully matured. And as a wannabe storyteller, I was realizing that it, it, it was a very hard upward battle to try to uh, create myths in the modern Hollywood. Uh, super expensive and, um, and lots of complications in terms of like, you know, who are you represented by? Do you have family in the business? Uh, are you a part of a guild? You know, all these things that can go to uh, better successes of your career path in Hollywood. But in games, it was, it was ripe. And I felt like I was playing games that were beginning to feel like films. And it started re redirecting my energy towards the possibility of making games that told stories in a more cinematic way versus trying to make movies. And I was an animator at heart, a character designer at heart. Uh, and writing was something I was working on my own because 
if you want to tell stories, you, you got to focus on writing. So I was looking at all of those things combined and realizing that we were at an opportune time in what was happening in video games that very shortly, if we started redirecting our attention there, we could have the opportunity to possibly have A, creative freedom, and B, tell stories in a more cinematic way. It just had to be a good game, too. And I found that a very exciting technical challenge. So I think that's, you know, still kind of a long-winded answer, but I think that shapes like what really made me believe that video games would place to tell stories and develop characters and make, and possibly even through the longevity of playing, give players a deeper connection to that character. And, um, you know, and then there's a million lessons uh, along the way, you know, and uh, learns that happen along the way. But I think that's the, the high level summary of why why games okay cool now let's talk about law um i know it's something the the community have asked for you know more on and uh we touched about it uh, just before the holidays uh, we did a live stream with uh ash and i think at the time uh, people were like let's do a lawn cast uh, with law, <laughs> law, law being the word and right, you know nice. that's that, that's like you know where we started on this chain of thought for creating this podcast series is to you know is to stick with us as we explore the law of odd world over the coming months you know what is it that binds everything together in odd world well um you know obviously i love lore my my favorite thing out of all things is actually research and i think all great stories um either they were probably inspired by a personal trauma tragedy journey you know um uh, which is kind of like someone's amazing biography, or where we have to be deeply researched into topics to extract information, um, insights that might not be popularly known, from which, you know, m many of the greatest stories are, are born out of is you take a topic that's not fully exploited and try to uh, bring something new to it. And um, so in the lore, to me, I grew up in a, uh, I had lived in, I think, 11 places before I was five years old. And wow. that was my father. It was, uh, you know, um, the Cold War, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, just, just after the Cuban Missile Crisis. And my father was a nuclear submarine, so we were just constantly being moved around to different places. And um, that gave me a unique look at the world that... Uh, I realized, you know, it wasn't shared necessarily by my peers growing up. It was kind of grim because I was just, you know, I mean, <laughs> as little kids, we were understanding the, the possibilities of, you uh, know, in, in a simple way, but the possibilities of like global thermonuclear war. And because um, these would just be topics when dad was home uh, and they were divorced at five. So that was not, he, he kept on doing those things and, you know, um, the family split up. But the point was, I just had this different perspective. And for some reason in my life, I've been able to walk through different cultures, uh, even, uh, you know, it might be predominantly in the United States, but there's a wide spectrum of different cultures in the United States from, um, you know, civil to criminal to, to all ranges of people. And I found similarities among people, no matter what uh, status or stratus they were at. And, um, and and then heroism in people at different levels and sometimes at least where you would expect it, you know. Um, I saw one, like the little things that shape your life and then you start thinking about how does, how does this become something later. I saw one of the people that most of us were like the most terrified of as kids. He was an older guy, really, really hard, hardcore um, person that no one would want to mess with. And I remember watching him one day because I, I, whenever I saw him, I was like, wow, keep your eye on that guy. <laughs> things happen around him, you know, and... People don't realize they shouldn't mess with him, but sometimes they would. And uh, and I saw him just uh, run out in the middle of the road one day and uh, help. It was literally a little old lady in a car that had stalled, you know, and this guy single-handedly, like, ran into traffic, kind of risked his life and just single-handedly pushed his car out of the way. And uh, the woman was totally grateful, and she was like, let me give you some money. He was like, if I take that money, where's my good karma coming from today, right? <laughs> so he was just like, this is my good day today. I'm, I'm due at least one per day. And then he moved on. And to me, that was like kind of one of the most heroic acts I'd seen. I was just a little kid still. It's like, wow, that was the last guy we'd expect to do that, but he did it. And I like that possibility of how out of unsuspecting places, people can have great moments, almost no matter who they are. You know, and there's something about when we make a decision in ourselves to step up and take a chance for the benefit of someone else, you know, in a um, selfless kind of way that I felt created a bit of a compass for something that we could all use 
and um, if we if we just believed in that premise, you know. And I had grown up a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous because my dad was uh, my parents were divorced. My dad had become a reformed alcoholic, and if I wanted to visit my dad on the weekends, I had to go with him to AA meetings, <laughs> and that was that was just unbelievable. The stories and the the way people could cut through other people's bullshit because they were all addicts, you know. It, it, so it was like another stratus of insight into rich people, poor people, sharing the same problems, um, living with the, in the same denials, coming to the same truths, uh, helping themselves or degrading themselves further. And so these stories about life and research and all that stuff, it really inspired me for the lore and the research and these, these experiences that people were having that showed us a better way, possibly, in our own behavior. And, and maybe, I always look at it like, life's like this complicated forest that's so easy to get lost in. We all need compasses, you know? And, and so it's not saying like, this is the right way to live, but a compass just kind of tells you, well, this is the right way for you to get to a better life for you. And, we all, and it's always different for everyone. And so that's kind of, again, a long-winded answer, I think, but I hope it addresses your question. Yeah. And, you know, one thing that you know, I'm sure a lot of the community um, agree with, you know, the the stories and, you know, the tropes within Oddwell are very, very relatable. Um, you know, the, there's, there's a feeling that you get when you when you play it, um, which, you know, is, is, is really awesome. So, you know, we've we've touched a little bit on the creation of Oddworld. We've touched a little bit on, on the lore. How does it, how do you approach, you know, the narrative, the story branch and when within all of the games that you've created so far within, within Oddworld? Well, I remember something that uh, James Cameron, if you go back in time to about the same year we started Oddworld, just shortly before then, James Cameron had started Digital Domain in Los Angeles. And they were talking about being a multimedia studio and doing movies and shows and also games. And I remember him, he, he said, and, and people at the time were talking about, you could have a story with 100 endings, and they were really getting into the forking trees of possibilities and, and of narrative possibilities. And Cameron said, you know, it's, it's hard enough to make a great story with one ending. If you have the same budget and you have to make 20 good endings, you're going to have 20 terrible endings and, and, and it's going to be missing the one good one. And I never forgot that because I, I was analyzing the, the challenges of a multi-pathing, um, you know, kind of the, a, the RPG course where you might unfold different stories. And in that, I, I, I tended to agree and I was like, well, how do we have different outcomes, but largely share the same story, but how you went through the story and what your behavior was and what you did or didn't do, that that could change your destiny. So for me, I was, you know, looking at games and people that were just talking about games and having, you know, multiple branches and where that went. And I still kind of believe it's hard enough to get one good story. And so we came up with, as we were really hashing this out, you know, as a team at Odd, Early Oddworld, was how can we have that your the story is largely constant, con, is, is calculating your deeds kind of the way um, in the spiritual terms people would say your, your karma, you know, is adding up on you or blowing back on you. And I was like, we, were, we started to figure out karma was an interesting way to allow the same meta story to unfold, but you have micro stories in how you treated someone on a level, right? Like, oh, I took this guy down here and then I sat him in this thing and I dropped this shit on his head and I was supposed to save him, but that was funny. You know, <laughs> <We're> like, okay, <laughs> well, we want you to be able to do that. Like, I was a little annoyed and I'm a huge fan of Nintendo and Miyamoto games and stuff. So, um, don't get me wrong at all, but I was really annoyed that there was certain characters. It's like, you can't do anything to that guy. And I was like, but I have the ability to punch. How come I can't punch him? <laughs> you know, it was, it, I felt like the, the rules were very confined. And so my feeling was, was, well, if we set forth with a presence that's noble, and then you're playing in a way that uh, for what the character's mission was, is not noble, then that could, that creates our fork in a calculation at the end that we called, you know, various karmic endings. And so our, our tree forking was always minimal in our games, but the outcome would unfold in multiple paths depending on how you played. And in Soulstorm, we wanted to push that a little further so that uh, if you were getting the better endings, you got you got further in the game. But if you got the bad ending earlier, it was a more sensational ending. And uh, so I hope that, you know, I hope that shines some light on that. Of course. Thank you very much. Uh, so we, we, we should also uh, give a brief mention uh, to Stranger's Wrath HD, which 
recently launched on uh, PlayStation and Xbox consoles. And that's a very different style of game and character than you know, some of the previous releases. But, you know, fans of Oddworld can relate to that game. Uh, can we just take a moment to discuss the inspiration for Stranger? Sure. It was um, uh, a, a lot of discussions come in around a lot of decisions come into play around what can you get financed um how hot are you at the moment you know there's all these different things that can reflect on what kind of game you can build and i'm it, it's just a reality of finance development capabilities um publishing deals things like that and uh the the launch of munch um it was it was it was disappointing to us because we wanted to hold the you know, without going into the details, it was a bit disappointing. And, and um, for for various sort of business or distribution or Xbox penetration into different pen, uh, places, it was a very hard title to develop in the first place. And so from there, I was like, I want a fresh look. And I feel like we're getting killed by shooters. And uh, and we did. We just got <laughs> decimated by, by uh, Halo, which um, deserved all the kudos it got. But uh, we were eclipsed, and um, there's a lot of different reasons why we can say how it performed or, or whatever. You know, I don't want to. That's all under the bridge. But the point is, at that time, for for us, we were looking, and I was like, if we had a shooter, we have so many more things that we can do. But I don't want to do a shooter the way shooters are done. Like, I want to bring something to it that would exude more character, be more centralized to who this character is, what his design is, what is. Uh, I want to have um, like. A first person, third person, exchangeable balance in skills where, um, you know, melee and speed was good in third person, but, you know, shooting was possible in first person, but you couldn't go as fast. And there was a lot of reasons for that in terms of strategy, like, can I run away fast enough where I don't get shot and I can retreat to a higher position? I felt a lot in times uh, in the shooting games that I was I was kind of in a match and um, I wasn't enabled the strategy to flee. So it was kind of like either I was better than you know, the other people we were playing or the NPCs or... Um, um, I would die. And I was like, I want a higher speed to be able to get out of trouble. And if someone wants to keep up with me, they're going to have to do the same, which I could use as an advantage as a player. On the other hand, I was looking at, um, with the team, I was, I was saying, this this Western genre of the Sergio Leone movie, movies was probably one of my favorite ever. And I loved it so much. And when we started thinking about, I was like, Westerns have been under underused in games. And I think there's you know, a good opportunity here. So we, we hashed around that for a while, what the play style would be. And then we were struggling with it. How do we make it different? And that brought up the idea of live ammo. Like, well, what if um, we have a shooter where the hero character hates guns? <laughs> right, right away, that's kind of like, what? And you look for sound bites that can sort of trigger interest. And for us, that was interesting, although it would add a lot of complication. And, um, a couple things people may or may not notice is like when strangers uh, in POV mode or moving slow, he's basically what I would call a pivotal character. He's able to pivot in a different direction instantly. But when he starts running at full speed, he's really becoming a motor motorcycle mechanic, which is uh, if you think of it that way, he, with more speed and acceleration, um, they can't just pivot on a dime. He has to sort of arc into it. So you can start running faster and faster and faster, but your turn would become just like a motorcycle. You can't turn as sharp anymore. So it's tricky to get two different core um, control behaviors and character movement behaviors based on which perspective you're in, third or first. And so those were things that all had to be shaken out. But the idea of the lone stranger which was re really the uh, an essence of all the Sergio Leone movies with uh, Clint Eastwood, you know, starring Good to Bad and the Ugly for a Fistful of Dollars, uh, you know, with these, cra these crazy great movies. I was like, what if we can take the tough guy and make him weak? Like, reveal, reveal um, his deficits his insecurities and in something you thought was very strong is actually going through its own issues uh suffering a different kind of lack and pain and um isolation and threat you know so i was like what if it was like a, a moose in hunting season <laughs> and so he's like he's got to decide himself to survive and you think he's out hunting moose but it, he's he's actually what would be hunted and then what kind of what kind of condition is he in? And in that case, you know, racism was a, a theme that um, I was like, this is an interesting 
theme that we can, you know, I think is really appropriate for Oddworld. So that, that was really the driving force to make it happen. Part of it was the need to do something that had more amortization in mechanics. And shooters have a lot of that. You know, a puzzle game, you have to have more mechanics to make the puzzle game more interesting. But with a shooter, it's kind of like, I'm oversimplifying, but for the sake of, you know, short conversation. In a shooter, you are you can almost build like one or two weapons that have a whole bunch of different parameters and then you assign different to them, right? But the essence of what's happening in the game, the characters are largely reacting the same. You're largely doing the same thing, but you get to use skill all the time. And um, so that was a, those are primary drivers for Stranger. And then we just wanted to create a tough guy that ultimately kind of broke your heart, you know? That was the idea. Whereas Aid was the opposite. Right. He was something that kind of broke your heart all right away. Same with Munch. And then they'd have to sort of uh, accrue bravery and purpose over time. And then that's what makes them something special is breaking out of that, that underdog position that they were in. And for Stranger, I wanted you to feel like you were a top dog, but you were really in an underdog position. And then that would be revealed through, the, through I would say, fork in the story. But I should say the tipping point of the story when Stranger gets depantsed. And, um, and then you find out, you know, it's a plot twist, but it wasn't a fork for the player. You know, the player didn't get to choose that or not. That was something that was happening if you were continuing to unfold the story. So I hope that, I hope that that's helpful as well. Yeah, that, that's great. Thank you very much for that uh, insight, Lon. And, and if, you, if you haven't had the chance to play uh, Stranger of Wrath HD, after hearing what Lorna said there, you know, please do go and check it out and come back to the uh, Stranger's Wrath channel and we can, we can have a, a discussion about it and um, talk more. On Stranger as well, just before we head into all of your questions, uh, we recently held a community fan art challenge uh, to celebrate the release of Stranger's Wrath. And uh, before this call, I shared, you know, some of the submissions with Lorn, and we had a look through. Lorn, what what do you think of uh, of the fan art that, that you saw? It always it always blows me away, you know, because um, uh, sometimes I'm trying to guess the age of the person, you know, and then other times there's there's a wide spectrum of skills. But what I love about fan art is that there's usually this this attraction to it that's m making the person want to create their version of it with the best of their skills. And I kind of adore that process. Like, I'm always amazed sometimes, you know. Um, most storytellers and stuff have a, a kind of bit of <laughs> insecurity on that. It's like, I don't know, does anyone actually like this shit I'm making? And uh, we're making, you know. But um, uh, the, the, the sorry, getting back to the core of your question. Okay. Yeah, so we're just talking yeah. about, you know, what what do you think of the fan art and, and, and the strangers? Yeah, yeah. So on the, on the fan art, I just love seeing it. And it's like, I don't think... The more I think the younger it is and the more that I could never think about drawing it that way, you know, you know, like sometimes there's something super valuable in that. I bought this book a while ago and it was um, a guy who had taken all of his children's drawings and then painted them. I forget what it was called, but he was a real high, high end illustrator. But, the, but it was basically like, you know, a really small kid doing these monster drawings. And then the father would paint them in, you know. But it was amazing. And the other thing, I, it was amazing to see, like, someone professional just taking the sketch that came from the, the kid. And uh, that, that always kind of amazed me. And taking that further is I, I, I would see people getting tattoos of their, their little child's art. You know, like their five-year-old's art. And then they'd get it as a tattoo. And I remember, uh, you know, searching for those. And they were some of the most precious things because you're, you're seeing someone's expression and then a twist on it. You know, you're seeing a twist on what you would expect. And one of my favorite in the drawings you were pulling up was the uh, drawing of Stranger where his fur and all was, um, was more emulating like a tiger or a, a cat or uh, Tasmanian tigers sort of uh, uh, patterns. You know, it was, it was different patterns. I was like, wow, I never thought of that for Stranger. You know, so, yeah. you, so you get these ideas just from looking at it. And like I said, I'm always amazed that people take the time to do it. So I love seeing it. Well, hopefully we can uh, create more for you to look at. And I, I think, you know, you know, from my perspective, it's it's one of the cool things about, you know, working within the community is seeing the passion of the community come out through art and appreciation of, you know, the games that you've created. Um, so just touching on that, keep a look out on the Discord. We'll be announcing the winners very soon. And we're going to have more fan art challenges for you to get involved in very, very soon. 
Okay, so now's the part of the show where um, you've probably all been waiting. Lauren will be answering your questions on some of the topics that we've just covered. As a reminder, if you want to ask a question for the next episode, the focus of that discussion will be on the exploration of Mudos. We're going to be looking at Rupture Farms, uh, Soulstorm Brewery, the Slick Barracks, and we'll also be celebrating one year since the release of Oddworld Soulstorm. So if you want to get your questions in, go to the Discord chat questions and ask your questions on those topics. And next month, around the middle of the month, date and time, TBC, uh, we'll be answering some of those questions. Right. Now we're going to go into the first question. And this one is from Sean uh, Badia. And I'm really sorry if I get any of your, your names incorrectly. There's been, you know, several questions about Munch on the theme of connecting it all together. Does Munch have any significance to the story of the Quintology going forward after Soulstorm? My understanding, so this is Sean's understanding, things will be more heavily focused on Abe throughout than originally intended. But knowing that there's still another moon out there with Munch's footprint on it, mm. as seen in Munch's Odyssey, makes him wonder if his presence will still be on the same level or if more of a, and this is a bit of a pun, footnote to Abe's journey. Well, the, the, the intention was that um, Munch, Munch would have a very uh, significant role. When it comes to content that hasn't been produced yet, I, I should say it all, almost always comes down to time, money, budget, production resources, and that can shape a story. And also whoever the partner is, if it's being financed. And one of the mistakes that I made in the beginning was I had the belief that uh, the IP could hold and then you could add characters to it like Marvel had done you know, or like DC had done. And I was thinking of it that way. And I wanted these characters to come together in this massive climax that was all related to Abe's journey. And um, without going into complications of business and timing and, you know, uh, trends and things like that, I feel like Munch has a really critical role to unfold. And and the stranger as well in Abe's journey. Prior to having finance and, in, and an agreement on, um, you know, how game and game, how big a game can be, what are all its features, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's hard. I, like, I've suffered a lot of blowback from speaking prematurely before something was fully financed or what we wanted to do. And so I'm more careful about that these days. Um, you know, people can be really disappointed. They, they could read that in different ways. And um, But the fact is, you know, time and events can change what your intended story was. And I say that because, like, at the release of Munch, we had, uh, this is just one example, we had lots of um, newspaper articles and stuff throughout the game that started describing Munch and Abe as two wanted terrorists. Uh, because, you know, if you go back to Rome, anyone who resisted the empire was eventually, you know, once the land was conquered, then they were labeled a terrorist. And I was kind of inspired by that that era when the beginning of terrorism got put on anything that was a threat to the uh, institutionalized um, ranks, let's say, or... or clans or whatever we might say the power holders were and what happened was right before release i mean we were almost going to gold on gold disc uh 9 11 happened and so 9 11 happened it was like oh my god this is tragic you know for those of us who remember that day and on another hand we were like holy shit we got a big problem because we're calling munch a terrorist and we're Abe a terrorist and because of what happened that's no longer a subtext of propaganda, that's directly offensive to people that have just suffered. And and so we had to instantly, like we called Microsoft, we're like, we gotta change all these all these headlines. And they were like, we were about to call you. <laughs> you know, so they, they got it too. And we said, we got we gotta fix this. Um, because it can be, it, we might have taken you three or four years to make, but it can be perceived as though you, you just came up with that right after this event, you know, cause you still had a window of time. I'd been stung in that in the past, like in previous, uh, lives and like illustrations stuff like that where you make something i was told by some really famous illustrators early they said you know I, i've done time magazine covers that then something happens and it gets pulled and i just don't get the cover you know i, I made it i was ready to go it would have been another cover for time that i had but shit happens in the world and um sometimes you know you just have to suck it up because it's not cool to release that publicly anymore and that was the case with much and uh, what was going on with uh, Stranger's Wrath. We had a similar problem with the three-fingered Abe 
and Abe's head on a popsicle stick in Japan. Um, we released uh, right before release, like a few days or weeks before release, we got a kind of emergency call that in Japan, um, a murder had taken place in a schoolyard, which was not common at all. And, uh, and uh, someone was beheaded, a student, and the head was put on a fence in front of school. And we had Abe with his head on a popsicle stick. And it was like, we got to change this. And so when it comes to story, those, I bring up those little examples, because when it comes to story, you might have a good, a great story, but the timing might be really bad. And um, so you have to sort of pay attention to where the public psyche is at. And if you're, if you're crossing a line that can easily be perceived as uh, disrespect or um, confrontational in ways that aren't healthy. And that's just so. So when it comes to story, time will shape some of, you know, the history ahead of us will shape some of what those stories can become or not based on events that happen in the world. And then for us, the the designers of that story, we have to adapt. And so when it comes to the Quintology, I really, I see Munch has a special place. I see Stranger has a special place, but it's all around in the grand epic mission of Abe, which is going to affect them all. I think that covers that. I think that does. Thank you very much for that. You bet. Insight, in, insight, Lauren. Yep. So the next question is from Dimitri Marcy, and um, he says, Dear Lorne, uh, what is the main message you want to send to the world with your games, stories, and IP in regards to Oddworld inhabitants? And has this message changed in any way from when you started to the latest release of Oddworld Soulstorm? I, I think that um, the message hasn't changed, and I think that message is this, that no matter what your lot in life, and no matter how low on the totem pole you may feel you are, and I had a lot of personal perspectives of that as, you know, as I grew up, um, that I wanted to create heroes that were in a worse place than you were. I wanted to create heroes that, that if you were suffering in your life, and I think the number of that is extraordinary in terms of people in the world, you know, but if you're sort of su suffering an anguish of position and lot in life, I wanted to create characters that came from a worse place that you could identify with. I mean, some people's stories are so tragic. I don't, I don't mean to say, you know, our stories are worse than everyone's individual stories. But my point being is that if you could identify with someone who was really at the bottom of the food chain, and then really through empathy, action, and will were... Uh, just just doing the right thing and and make learning and becoming something different themselves stepping up in their own lives and taking that you know by the taking that bull by the horns and not letting ever anyone tell you how you can't like not believing the naysayers in your individual capability that's the heroes i always want to create and ho and hopefully i i kind of am always in that track for the odd world ip absolutely i can't imagine it not being in that on that track and able increase in visibility and fame and notoriousness um and and being wanted at like a, you know bin laden like level for all the wrong reasons but um i i it's important to me that our characters aren't characters that you just wish you were which is how i feel about you know like the big shooting game, you know, muscle-bound characters or the Marines and stuff. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a badass. I'm going to do this. That's all cool. But I was hoping that we would create characters that could be inspiring because of how you help them succeed in their plight, which was basically a mission impossible. And I think that I think that, that nails it. Yep, I think that does. Just just a reminder, you know, if you're listening to this, if you, if you want to, you know, follow along, discuss, please do. And uh, we'll come back to your discussions after the show. So we got, next question is around the various uh, voices in Art World, and uh, now you uh, voice a few. And the question yeah. is, and, and there's been a few questions on similar subjects. So, Stranger Fan, 235, Judo 7, and how's our gaming? Uh, where did you get the inspiration for the voices of Abe and Stranger, and how hard is it to do these? And one other mention just before you answer that. In the questions channel, a member Dudes107 has provided a link to some of his own impressions for quite a few of the uh, characters. So if oh, you get nice. a moment, go and listen to that. Um, very, very good. And um, yeah, I'll, sh I'll share those with Lorne afterwards and Lorne can yeah, give his take. <laughs> so yeah, so Lorne, so, so how, how, how do you get the inspiration for the voices and um, how hard is well, it to do one, those? Uh, uh, 
I, w- I wanted to uh, be be in a almost like slapstick level of performance. And if we went back to the black and white movies, um, you know, Buster Keaton and uh, things of that nature, the silent movies, um, it's, it, everything was an exaggerated performance. You know, it was like it, it was way over the top, melodramatic. And I was like, oh, that's great. That's great for games, you know. And so I wanted to um, keep. And and then it comes to uh, kind of over the top or guttural, like if I go oh you know you can feel the disappointment if I go yeah you can feel you know a little bit, sense of victory. So how much could we achieve with guttural language uh, utterances, and then how much could we get towards a my all time hero of um, voices is Mel Blanc you know from the Looney Tunes, and it's just like the range of this guy was unbelievable. And then two it would have to go to like the Muppets you know. And part of that was like every the the puppeteers and the Muppets had to um, had to do the voices, so it was kind of one and the same. So I was trying to get animators to do more voices <laughs> yeah, to follow the uh, Jim Henson model. But then what I was trying to do was get that over the top performance, but you totally felt the authenticity of where it was coming from. So with Abe being, you know, one who was like almost in a constant state of of um, oozing with empathy, but but pressured by by uh, danger, and that his voice should just have that that ring to it. That's that that feel, feels like I, I was I was modeling a lot of it after dogs, like the way you felt about a dog that you were connected to. And I have I've had some really strong relationships with dogs. I just mean connecting in ways that when I see how other people treat dogs, sometimes even though they're good people, I just feel sorry for the animal because there's so much. The person's not listening to that the animal's trying to convey, and um, and so for Abe, it was kind of, it was kind of in Munch. I was kind of like, if if a puppy could talk, you know, and I don't mean in a very uh, uh, you know sugary, uh, <laughs> overly sugary way. I just mean if if the innocence could talk. And I remember um, uh, what's the name uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, um, Johnny Depp talking about his character in Edward Scissors' hands, and, he's, and he goes, and they were like, where did you get, you know, where did you get that conveyed such innocence and vulnerability? He was like, I was just trying to be my dog that I grew up with. And I was like, what would my dog do? How would it look? And that's, that was how he <laughs> shaped his performance and probably was one of his greatest performances, in my opinion. But um, the idea of having them over the top, but having, so you have almost this cartoon-like level of exaggerated voice, but if we could keep it sincere to the emotions it was experiencing and then put it in really heavy stories. I was, I was seeing that as a signature for the brand, that we could have this sort of, sort of endearing comical voices in some of the heaviest content and stories, you know, that you could imagine, right? Like coming from the uh, factory that chops you, up, chops you up as product for the retirement plan, but they're lying to your life. What, pretty dark you know it wasn't like yeah this is gonna be a really popular video game you know i I expected no marketing department to say but um hopefully that's helpful yep yep that's great thank you thank you for that you bet the the next question is from Susie, who also says uh thank you very much for answering a question back on the december live stream and um she wants to know about abe's name so we know uh abraham is some form of biblical reference but where did yeah lure come from lure one of my first loves is fishing like fly fishing and it's really about patterns and understanding the fish and i I catch and release like i don't i don't like killing things um i'm not a a vegan or vegetarian you know like i'm still meat eater and stuff so i don't mean to be too righteous on that front but um i was i was i was feeling like the the world religions were shaped by uh individuals whether real or fabricated individuals that had achieved something extraordinary and tapped into something that you know one could say is god or source or you know the 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 uh the 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 force like stars star wars would speak to and um in that if we go like uh islam uh, judea Christianity, they were all figured around, centered around Abraham, this figure, all of them. And this figure had sort of stepped out of, uh, of uh, a way and, and said, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's the force. And it's not, you know, this sort of pagan structure. 
and not that I have much opinions versus, you know, pagans versus uh, monotheism, but I was more interested in the journey of an individual that could become something that in time would become a symbol for other people even thousands later. And so I, I was thinking, okay, Abraham is kind of that figure in our world's history. And then lure is what you use to attract a, a, an attractor pattern. Like you use it in fishing, you use a lure, right? Or mm -hmm. why you're luring the, the, uh, the target. And so I wanted this idea that Abe would be bringing a new model of understanding to the world that they lived in, which was largely a world saturated in misinformation, propaganda, um, overly exploited uh, corporations, overly exploiting corporations and sort of the ruthlessness that can come with all that. And the Abe would sort of shine up, show a different way and take a place in, in that world's history where then if there was a second quintology, it would come later and people would be wearing necklaces. And so it would be an idea amongst the population going through another journey itself. So that was, I was, I was kind of working like if you were doing stories of these mythological figures that then became, you know, Buddha, Muhammad, Jesus, uh, across the world, different, different entities, you know, even in paganism, you know, different, uh, uh, Hinduism, you'll have different figures. And I was like, what does a figure have to do to become one of those monuments of history? And that was a big part of what drove the naming of Abraham Lur. And that, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of a, a mix, I guess, of Abraham and, and Moses into the idea that one could then lead his people out of slavery. So it was those big metaphors that really shaped the name Abraham Lure. He would be one that brought a new way, and he would be attracting others to, to that outlook, to that perspective. That's really cool. Thank you for that. I hope that answered your uh, question, Susie. Great question. So the next one, this is from Retro Spidey. And um, so, yeah, submitted quite a few questions, and they're all very good questions. And I think we're going to come back to a few of those over the course of the episodes but for the first one played odd world games back in the 90s as a child and then became a huge fan so i think one probably one of the older members in the discord and the question is you know which level stage of scenes are your favorites uh, from the odd world games and you need to admit whether or not you have a bad ending amongst your fave as well <laughs> um so uh I felt like Munch's ending, you know, people were kind of shocked that, that some of the bad ending in Munch with both of their heads on a plaque. We were we were kind of comedically laughing about it. <laughs> I see how other people enjoyed it on a different level. Um, but I think, uh, uh, I have to say, I, I like the Soulstorm bad ending. I felt like it was the, the most visceral and um, kind of devastating bad ending. And if you got the worst ending, you know, I like the lore that is created of how much impact that caused across the world, you know, that these events have events have these ripple effects that affect the rest of the planet in some way or the continent. And so I really liked the, I'd say for bad endings, I, th I think that um, the Soulstorm had the, the most, let's say, explosive bad ending. And, uh, but in all of them, those, those bad endings are sort of cherished, you know, and um strangers was different right he didn't go that he had, he had a, a different thing happening but um for those ape games the the yes so some had that one in the first one was kind of a shocker you know uh how, how do we start at the beginning how do we leave abe hanging we have all your actions throughout the course of your gameplay take you back to that moment and that kind of inspired Soulstorm's opening as well, where we'd say, we, we see that this is happening in the world. Now we're going to go back in time. We're on that train towards the end, but now we're going back in time. It was very similar to Abe's hanging in the cell at the beginning and at the end of Abe's Odyssey. And, um, and I think uh, Abe's exodus and Munch's ending weren't as um, synergized, I should say synthesized into the whole overtone of the experience as much as they were just kind of a bad ending. But I think Souls, in my opinion, Soulstorms and the Apes Odyssey had a wider girth of of range of what each end, ending constituted. And it kind of began at the, it ended at the beginning, if that makes sense. You know, we started off, how did the ape get in this Hang, hanging over this meat grinder. That was Abe's Odyssey. And in Soulstorm, how did, how did they get up on this train? 
And so we take you back in time in each case, case and you're playing the history that led to that moment. I love that scenario. Um, and Soulstorm, it got longer to to set up the story, you know, to, to pull that off. So the opening movie became a bit long. But, um, yeah. So I, ho- I hope that's helpful. Yeah, it's, well, you know, it's it's great having you here and great having you uh, with the community and answering the questions. And you know, I'm cer- certainly you know learning a lot, and uh, you know, it's, it's brilliant. So thank you very much uh, for you know giving up your time for this. Yep. So yeah, so the next question, and I mentioned it, I mentioned it just then. This is you know we'll, we'll, we'll we will come onto this um, a bit more. I think around June, the uh, title of that episode is called uh, "What Lies Beneath." But this is from the magician. Uh, during Old World Soulstorm, Abe is given a mysterious amulet containing a queen bee. Yes. It, what is the backstory to this, if you if you can share any of that? So um, this gets into the keepers, the the uh, the lake of honey that is what's in the catacombs, and um, the if you if you notice the the. It, 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 on all these things, I just want to say, I always wish I had more budget, <laughs> you know what I mean, <laughs> so that we could put more detail and really, really take it to the next level. But you know, um, you know, Soulstorm, we paid for ourselves. It's very, very challenging. But um, the bees on our world are a way of measuring the health of the planet. And I'm, I'm just going to give a personal two cents here on on sort of contemporary trends in news and such that we're talking about carbon but we're not talking about the bee die off or the bird kills or the fish kills or the plastic in the oceans as as a massive problem is really suspect to agenda and um the bees are the health of a world and so the idea of the catacomb and the lake of honey is a couple fold one the the I wanted to get more of this into the production design, but it's the intent of that lake that walk, Abe walks across to find the monument of, of himself, which is in prophecy. It was built, and these people have been waiting for Abe to come. And one at a time, the keepers take care of the hive, and the hive is a hive of memory. And the lake was supposed to be, we just didn't have time and, and budget to get all this in, but the lake was supposed to be that when the tide of the lake was high, when the honey was high, then the world was in good health above. But when the lake would get low, so the bees would have their path in and out of this deep, most secret place in the world that stored the most valuable truths in the history of the world. And they were not popular, popularly known at all. In fact, they were hidden and buried with time. But the bees would have a way in and out of the world. So as a hive, this hive was the hive that would be the thermometer for the health of the planet. And so if the lake was high, then the rock formations that break and have the the sort of megalithic uh, resonance effect when it taps in, that, that when it's high, it would reveal on the stone carvings the faces of, of bliss. Sort of if we could imagine a Buddha or various uh, uh, entities, deities that would be more blissful, more, um, more about peace. That's what you would see revealed. And as the tide would get lower, and I'm saying the tide of the health of the earth, if we think of that as a tide that comes and goes, when the tide was lower, it would reveal really sad and tormented faces that were carved in the stones. And so it was almost like a thermometer. It would tell you the health of the world above without you having to go up. And in this case, the tide is getting low. And this is subtle stuff, right? Like it's not even talked about in the game, but I was trying to, we were trying to get all that into the production design. And, I'm always, and this is, could be applied to so many different things that are designed in the world. But I really wanted to get that in there. It was very difficult, um, just for timing and, and opportunity. And those moves, movies were all uh, largely assembled. Um, you know, we had animation teams doing things, but... But Tom on the production team is uh, sort of a miracle in pulling together all the effects and the lighting of the scenes and pulling the geometry from, you know, the, the art team to uh, amortizing as much as possible. Being a real wide-handed skill, he was able to, um, 
you know, bring all of the scenes of Soulstorm together. And so he and I spent a tremendous amount of time together. But that just goes to time and budget and what you lose. So the B was one of the oldest bees. And if you notice, it had sort of a, a Egyptian um, death, what we would call the, uh, the mum, the death mask, you know, what they would wear uh, in, in a tomb, Egyptian royalty. And the idea was that the work, the, the handiwork, the craft that put it together was impossible. And so you're looking at something that's impossible. It would be this micro jewelry making that made this this bee have this wear. And it's inside a hand-blown piece of glass amulet that's airtight. And so this thing is kind of its own miracle. And it was a bee that would that has lived like the keepers for a tremendous amount of time, like possibly thousands of years. So in a sense, it's kind of like a I don't mean this in a negative sense, but if um when a, vi- a vampire, you know, might be, as we just take that lore, might be uh, a thousand years old. And then, uh, but the, upon the sunlight, you know, its real age is revealed and it just turns into dust. So with the, the bee, it was kind of like that. But instead of being something that was negative, it was something that was holy. For lack of a better word, holy. And what I mean by holy is not according to anyone's scriptures. It's the idea that it comes from some place some things that were greater than ourselves, wiser than ourselves, and and it could be a divine divination tool. And so um, if, if anyone's familiar with dowsing or, or principles like that, um, the idea was that this divination tool would be sent to Abe by the keeper, and the messenger delivers that. And we show it as a MacGuffin, right? We're not showing you what it is until um, we, we finally unwrap it with uh, Toby and Alf. But that was the idea, was that you're, you ha- you're in the presence of something that's, for lack of a better hold, for a better word, holy. And I don't mean that in a religious sense. I mean that in a spiritual sense that it came from sources that are beyond our comprehension and beyond our wisdom and uh, care about us, care about the planet. And, uh, you know, if we were in Hinduism, there would be various deities that would represent these, these kinds of you know, protections, right? And Buddhism would have similar. Um, if you were in uh, Native American lore, you'd have other, other deities that would fulfill similar roles. And they're always uh, miracles. And so this, this, the idea of this bee was that it was a holy relic miracle that would be sent to Abe, and then it would guide Abe back to the catacombs. And through its guidance, and it would do that guidance through, this way we made it kind of like a lightning bug, that it could use the amulet to magnify its, its light emission into a beam and then identify places on a map that would lead them back to the keeper who had sent that out through, you know, an underground to reach the one that needed to get it, which was Abe. And then for a bad karmic ending, the idea was that if, Abe's, if Abe didn't stay, his heart didn't stay true to the mission, and let's say he became more of a, a killer than a savior, then that would ultimately kill this miracle. You know, and that would just be devastating. You know, so for Abe, it was heart shattering that this happened. And that was the perfect sort of catalyst to to create the tragedy that ends them all was the idea. That's awesome. Well, that certainly answered the question, <laughs> okay. I am sure. And, um, you know, it's something that we're going to come back to um i think in, in a bit more detail i mean that was a lot of detail there and i hope um you know you all uh, got something from that i certainly did got another question about uh, soulstorm and this one is from uh, ricky it's uh, who were who were those other gluckens at the board meet in Ru- rupture farms who also died there and what is the relation to uh, moloch uh, because these glucks don't appear to be you know missed in uh, soulstorm Right, <laughs> right. So um, they they mo- most likely perished in the farm. Right, <laughs> that, that's the idea. And uh, and they would have been um, subordinates, like vice presidents and things like that. And we 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 created some vice presidents for uh, Abe's Exodus, right? And you know that's where you got you got Aslick and and the the kind of hilarious characters. I I, I thought kind of hilarious. Chris Holm had a lot to do with uh, shaping the story around. He was the, he was he was on that project, um, 
very well. And he was the founder to uh, Malibu Comics, if I remember that. So Chris was an amazing, and we used to, uh, you know, think think about these. Uh, uh, what are the Gluckins? What are the stories? What makes them funny? And then it always comes down to how much time and money do you have? You know, so in Odyssey, the idea was some of them would be like vice presidents and others would be uh, from investor holdings coming in, representing investors. So coming in for the board meeting, you know, in this original script, I think we had that you could see them arriving and then uh, and then they'd leave. And when they left, everything would start to unfold like on a, on a different level, you know, and um but time and money is like shit. But we, you know, that's seven minutes of animated cinematics. We, we need two minutes. And so stories are always shaped like that out of the necessity of production, time, energy, budget, you know, team, resources, all those things. But that was the idea is that there were basically secondary cast that represented uh, an elite that was profiting off the demise of others. And so to me, they were kind of inspired by like military industrial complex type of characters. Or, I think, I think, yeah. Like later on in our episode series, we, we are going to do a bit of a, a deep dive into these characters as well. Uh, I'd love to, even on yeah. stuff we haven't touched on, but but more of the plight of the Gluckins. And one of the things I always wanted to do with Oddworld was make it so that right when you thought you understood who the big bad guys were, you realized they're just pawns in the game. X-Files, the TV series, the X-Files, did this really well. If you watched it over the years, and it used to, Sherry used to make it mandatory for employees who were <laughs> supposed to watch it, but our, our hold music at the company was X Files theme. And, um, but the thing about that was you always, great, I think great stories are like, you think this guy's good, or I should say the making of great stories is serious. You think this guy is really the bad guy, he's got all this power, and then you find out he's just a pawn in the game. It was an old Bob Dylan song. It was like uh, it was like that, and you realize the king was just a pawn in the game. And he goes on and on and on, you know, sort of repeating that lyric and with different scenarios. And and so that was the real driver of the Gluckins. That you're gonna you're gonna see something that looks like it's really in control, and then you're gonna realize it's uh, for, for to put it crudely, someone else's bitch. You know that that it would be the servant to other things you didn't know yet. And in X Files, those of you that were X Files fan, you know, the cigarette smoking man was a great example of that. He was a figure that you'd see, and it seemed like it was just this all-wielding, powerful figure on the dark side. And then you find out, you know, he's really just a slave, too. And uh, I like that model because it allows you to keep on upping the game. And you, you think you know the universe, and then you realize you just need a snapshot of it. And I think that's important for longevity of people's interest in lore, that they, you have to feel like, as a fan, I think, and this is how I feel as a fan of IPs, you have to feel like the creators had a lot more intent and have a lot more lore going on than what's on the screen. And then, and then we become more curious to want to know what that was. I always, you know, games are a really slow process to make. I, w- I wish we could make them much faster. I wish uh, I had the opportunity. There's, it's a possibility of a number of things happening with the property. One that was exciting to me was uh, one of my favorite uh, comic book graphic novel artists in ever uh, out of France um, created a number of series and there was the possibility that he could be working on the Odd World Quintology as a graphic novel series and that almost floored me you know I was so excited about the possibility um, but you know some illness and, and COVID and other things sort of changed all that but man I would just love to be telling a story without having a huge complicated game that takes years to build. You know? Well, and, you know, you've got a captivated audience here, so I'm sure, you know, over the, over the next few months we can, we can tell stories on, on the various topics and, you know. Would love to. That would be, that'd be awesome. I'm sure everyone would really appreciate that. You bet. We've got a few questions left. Yeah. Uh, if, that, if that's okay. This will be probably a quick fire question. Are, are these working for the, for the crown? This, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Because I'm yeah, not seeing the chat, but I'm, I'm yeah, so yeah. It's going okay. Yeah, well, well, people are still here listening to us, so that's a good sign. Okay, good sign. So yeah, so the next question is from uh, Fierce, and would like to know if you could work in any of Oddworld's factories, which one would you choose? And also, if you could live in any place on Oddworld, where would you live? Wow. Wow. 
Um, Nollybab, probably. <laughs> just because it's going to be like, you know, Nollybab, the idea was, to, you know, take Tokyo, New York, and Shanghai and, and kind of mix them together with a bit of, uh, you know, Bollywood or something. And, and you'd, you'd be in this, like we imagine walking down the Hong Kong streets would have been, you know, uh, 50 years ago, but out of something like Blade Runner. You know, and I don't mean with all the super advanced technology, but the idea that it's a city of millions and millions it's a lot more high tech than the third world where Abe's coming from. And so um, I, 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 if I had to work at one, <laughs> uh, probably self stone brewery, right? <laughs> but, but, uh, but that was pretty grim too, right? So uh, that's a good question. But let me, let me just say one of the things about Abe's working there that I, I hope to be able to tell. It's tough to tell in game form because it's much more into the nuances of story. Um, but the idea, Abe was in, Abe was, you know, mopping floors and stuff like that, but he also served as a midwife because the, cat, the cattle business needed people that could help deliver a difficult birthing. And you don't want to lose the, you know, just look at it from strictly business perspective. You don't want to lose the, the cow that's giving the birth um, and because, you know, it can give more births, right? I'm just thinking like a glucken. And, uh, but at the same time, if it's having problems, you might lose the one being birthed and the birther. So you, you got to have someone that knows how to fix that problem. And Abe was sort of a midwife that would be pulled in. And so he would, he would just have this way with animals where um, he, he could comfort them. And he would name them all, even though they just had tags and numbers, he would name them all and he would develop relationships with them, but he never wanted to see the slaughter end of the, of the factory. And so he actually loved his job and he lived in a deep denial of what was actually happening. So there's like, maybe, maybe uh, as we go into the future, we can show some paintings from uh, Raymond Swanman had done that we worked on. A lot of paintings were done uh, for the exploration of an Abe movie. And I really wanted to focus, or let's say Abe was a series. It would be my hope that almost the first season takes place in Rupture Farms before he escapes. That that's how deep I think this story inside Rupture, Rupture Farms could go and keep on unfolding in an exciting way to the end of the season where it's like holy shit you know they take over they they split the farm in this you know in this epic kind of moment which would be one we haven't seen yet because it, you know let's say we could do it as like a netflix series or something like that it could be way more epic and the idea would be that the idea was was that he's deeply connected to animals and at the same time just just kind of had to live in a state of denial to exist because it, otherwise it would just would have shattered him. It just would have shattered his heart to see all these friends. And there's a painting that maybe we can share on a future thing, Dan, if you could give me a, on a future Discord talk. There's a painting that Ram, Raymond Swanland had done where Abe's, it, it shows him coming back with the tag of one of his friends that had been slaughtered. And then he comes back to his cell. And when he hangs it on the wall, it's kind of, if you remember the, the key keeper in the Matrix, the key maker, mm -hmm. well, it's kind of like that. And then you just see there's thousands of these tags on the walls that Abe has written a name on top of the number. You know, and it'd just be like, to me, just kind of devastating, you know, just heartbreaking. And so he's just a figure that's kind of figuring out, I can only make, his plight was, I can, I can only make so much difference, but at least I can bring these animals some comfort in times of need. And um, I feel really passionate about hoping to tell that story in greater detail someday. But uh, I know that veered a bit from what factory I'd like to work in. But it goes to, like, the life in the factories is a story upon itself that we've barely been able to shine light on. Well, um, I'm sure everyone listening in will be uh, looking forward to that episode where we can you know, go a bit deeper in that. And okay. I think, you know, in terms of special guests, we're hoping to get uh, Raymond to come on. And, uh, you know, maybe the two of you can talk about that in much more detail, which will be amazing. Next question. Yeah. We have from Lego Space Felix. And this is going back to a new and tasty. Um, and in that, there's a reference to a character called Mama Flabby. Her name Flabby. Is, is a heart with an arrow over it. And 
it's during a scene where Abe has been captured and he's about to be executed. And is there any backstory to this character or any significance to the graffiti on the wall? And that's on the wall in the cell, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, see, <laughs> I think that was the UK team. And, and well, it was the UK team, right? It was at, I don't remember who, who did the art on the wall, but they wanted to embed message that, that would be unlocked. And I think we never, like we were now that game ARGs and, and things of that nature. Yeah. So there was an intention on it. And then Ma, Mama Flabby would be going back to names that people would have had for the uh, Mudokan mother, but it all, also could have been in contact. Like the idea was that it could have been confusing once you understand. You're like, wait a minute, does that mean that character or does that mean that character? And so was it written by Mudokans that were going to be talking about their mother? Or was it kind of written by Gluckens or Sliggs that was talking about their mother? And so we wanted to to sort of stimulate that as a question. And then I just think, you know, um, we just never got to it. But I, if I'm recalling correctly... I, I'm sure it's something that we can look into and you know come back in another episode with a bit more detail on if it's sure. you know let us know uh in the general odd world channel if that is something that you want to know more about anything else any you know st stuff appears on on the walls uh let us know and we'll we'll put something together for a, for a and, future and, episode and i and i just want to say um it goes to uh other characters in the in the uh in the history of of odd world especially artists, right? Artists will put things in and sometimes the director doesn't even know about it. Right? It's kind of the, the creative license of an artist, you know, to, uh, to sneak something in. And I just remember this one thing, and I think you might find it funny. When I was working on Rhythm and Hughes, we were working on co commercials. I think it was Crest or Colgate, you know, we were doing a Colgate commercial. And they're showing a tube of paste, which is, you know, 3D computer graphics back in the 80s. And um, it's playing on, on this digital playback machine back then it was like a hundred thousand dollar machine i think it was called d1 and uh it's playing on d1 and it's looping and the client is is getting the review and they're looking at it strangely and they walk up and as it's playing they hit freeze frame you know pause and at that moment of pause the guy looks at the screen and he goes six 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 you know how the the uh the bottom of a, a tube of toothpaste is squeezed yeah the crease in the crease was written, <laughs> 666, <laughs> Satan loves you. And, and the client was like, someone thought they were going to be clever. You know, if you look at the history of Disney, the artists at Disney did shit like this all the time. Um, there was a recalled uh, uh, poster from, uh, uh, I think it was uh, the Ariella, Ariel movie. What, what was that? The, uh, uh, Little the Mermaid? Ariel. Little Mermaid, yeah, and I, think I only were, I only know that because my daughter watches it all the time. <laughs> yeah, it might have, might have been one of the other stories, but there was a castle and there was all these like, phallic stuff in it, and no one caught it. <laughs> it, went to, it went to print, and then you know it became like one of the biggest collector's item ever. If you if you had an original copy of that cover of a castle, because there was all these phallic shapes in there, so artists have the capability <laughs> of slipping things in. The question is, did anyone catch it? You know. But, now everyone's uh, going to be replay, re replaying all of the um, the games and seeing what they can see, and I'm sure there'll be tons of discussions about another, Easter eggs another, and, and such like. And another famous one there, just real quick, was in, if you watch Star Wars really closely, there's one scene where the TIE fighters and the X-Wings are all fighting each other, and one of them that goes by is a sneaker. It's an athletic shoe. <laughs> like, it's there. It's in the original. It might not have been in remake they might have taken it out but it was in the original one of them is just like there's so much happening on screen you never see the speaker fly by <laughs> but it was you know so uh sometimes you go we don't have to fix it no one noticed it and other times yeah. you're like what did they slip in there like the the two toothpaste you know that didn't... okay and i feel like this is a community challenge you need to all go and play all of the games and see what you find and let us know uh in preparation for the next episode okay Lon. so we've got one final question yeah, and this question is from Nemen. So back in 2017, we announced that we found Abe's Odyssey source code, and that we were going to talk about it in due course. What happened to this, and um, you know, do we think we'll do anything with any of the old, older games, older IP? It was actually uh, used at the core of remaking 
uh, new and tasty. So, so that that became the code when we finally recovered it, and we had a long time, you know, searching through mountains of terabytes of data to actually find it. And when we found it, they uh, they started making the project with that code, and so that was that was one application, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then the other is we've wanted to do more mod like community stuff, and um, you know the way like it had done it, uh, others others had been able to do that, um, but we didn't have the the I would say the uh, division that it takes to to handle that and also handle it in the legal respect of trademark and copyright protections and all these things that are always highly annoying. But if you if you don't abide by these uh, you know standards of of uh, it's it's kind of maritime law really that um, you know the rest of the world abides by you can you can lose a lot of uh, value in your IP. And so we never quite figured that problem out to release it to the public. I think it's it's desirable to be able to do those things, but um, you know, there's expenses incurred and in, in time and energy that it takes to to make sure that that can happen in a way that you know is 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 good for everybody. Um, but it takes some overhead to figure out, and I think we've at many times but always been under such pressure. Um, and time and uh, game making games is it, it, it's ex extremely difficult, uh, you know, to make to make decent games, and so it's just something we didn't get to. But I can't say that it's something we won't get to. Um, it's been a desire to allow the community to have that, but we haven't put the mechanisms in place to uh, enable that yet. And I can't promise that it would be happening, but it's definitely, I think, in everyone's interest to to let it go out and let it proliferate in different ways. But it can also complicate um, business negotiations you might be in at the moment and, you know, without getting down the rabbit hole of all the legalities on things. But I, I think that's a short answer that it, that we did use it. It was reused in Exodus. It was the, uh, I'm sorry, New and Tasty. It was the basis of uh, ramping that up. And then, uh, you know, we evolved past it. But it did have, again, usage, but it hasn't been released to the to the crowd. Okay. That's awesome. Well, appreciate that. I'm sure Nemin will appreciate that that question has been answered and everybody else who's been talking about modding and uh, all sorts of things from back in the day. Uh, we do have a, um, a channel on the Discord called Mod World. Uh, so if you want to continue that discussion, uh, you're, welcome to, you're welcome to go in there. And uh, yeah, um, maybe you know, in, a, in a future episode, we can come back to this uh, as well. It'd so be happy that, to. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Thank you. So that's about all we have time on the clock for questions today. Uh, we have gone over by 35 minutes, but you know that's <laughs> how, these, how, how these things go. <laughs> but one thing I would say is you know, thanks for all of the questions that you submit so far. If we've not answered your question now, we will aim to answer you know, most of them uh, over the next uh, few months or so. One thing I would say is try and keep the questions on the topic for the episode. So the next episode is exploring uh, Mudos. And give you enough time to ask those questions and that just helps us to keep each episode on track so lawn you know it's been an absolute pleasure having you with us here today and i'm sure the community already marking their calendars in anticipation for episode two and that's coming in uh mid-april uh, time will be announced and also to everyone out there, you know, keep an eye out on the Discord for those details. You'll also be able to listen to this show as podcast. We'll make those links available soon after. We need to edit the show as we need to do. And as a reminder, you know, you're welcome to come back, join us live. Uh, for the next one, we you know really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this, please tell your friends. Uh, hopefully, you know they can join the official Oddworld Discord, and we can have more discussions about everything we've talked about today. You'll also be able to find various clips on our official social media, so Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and we have a TikTok as well. And that's about it for today. So thank you very much for you know coming, joining us. Thank you very much, Lorne, and uh, we'll see you all on the next one. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.